both my wax card wax. Yes. Uh, minister, distinguished panelists, uh, now it's time to uh, turn our minds and thoughts, ideas to security sector. Uh, and as you notice from the programs, and today we are covering three main areas. Uh, so the first one was economic sector, which we very lively and I think very richly debated uh, a short moment ago. Now it's time to go to security sector. And Turkish ambassador already in his intervention uh, in the first panel mentioned that if we look at Central Asia, then there are two uh, decisive issues at the core of uh, its political agenda and its security and stability. Uh, and for very long years, when we are looking backwards uh, to uh, Afghanistan, then indeed uh, there was no even need to talk about security. Uh, today's situation uh, is much more diverse. And even despite the fact that security in Afghanistan is taken care of by national armed forces, so international presence is still very strong there. But Central Asia was very much mentioned as one of the group of countries standing on the borders, but uh, security inside the Central Asia was not uh, appreciated, I think, in, in political and uh, academic discourse uh, sufficiently enough. So therefore, to very large extent today, we are not going to talk about Afghanistan. Of course, we will mention it along the lines, you cannot avoid this issue anyway. But uh, the core of discussion today is exactly what is happening in Central Asia. What is security agenda in this country? And how those in, the, in, in this region, and how five regional countries are trying to address their regional and national security uh, agendas. So therefore, our focus will be mostly on what is happening in Central Asian countries, but of course, other factors are, are, are play, playing a very big role. We have four uh, excellent speakers. I cannot imagine better panel as this one. So thank you, gentlemen, for accepting our invitation. We will start with uh, our Latvian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Edgar Svinkevich, uh, who has uh, a very distinguished career in, 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 in policy making and in politics as well. So I would like just to remind the audience that uh, Mr. Svinkevich was uh, the State Secretary at the Ministry of Defense exactly during those years when we were fixing our security and stability issues joining uh, the European Union and, and, and NATO. And security issues were always on Mr. Rinkevich's plate. Uh, then we have uh, Alan De La Truth, who is a senior associate fellow at uh, the Friede uh, think tank based in Brussels, but focusing on a very wide range of issues. And uh, he was also vice president at the International Crisis Group, so which has a very big role to play as a second track a diplomacy uh, actor in solving different issues. So he was also at the International Committee of the Red Cross in Moscow, so which gives you another experience and perspective in this region. And very many other interesting jobs which Alain de uh, was taken during his long career. Uh, then we have Ambassador Professor Punchak Sobda uh, from India. Uh, he uh, was uh, ambassador at Kyrgyzstan, so he has very good knowledge uh, of, of, of this region. Uh, ambassador, I read your book which you gave me in India a year ago, and uh, I uh, could really, uh, with great pleasure, say that this is one of the best books about Kyrgyzstan which I read, because this is a story insider story, if I may call it so, very detailed, going layer by layer of Kyrgyzstan society and, and giving a very first-hand um, information. And at the present moment, uh, he works at the Center for Strategic and Regional Studies and is also very well known as an expert who uh, publishes his articles in, in, in Indian and international media. Then I also would like to present another ambassador, Ambassador Ashok Sahyabyar, who was Indian ambassador in Latvia. 
So therefore, he has very good knowledge of Latvian affairs, but besides of that, he was also ambassador in Kazakhstan. So therefore, you are one of uh, quite unique representatives uh, in, 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 in this panel who has the knowledge of, of both sides of the coin, if I may call it so. So, uh, and also Ambassador writes quite a lot about international affairs, about Central Asia and India in uh, the leading uh, magazines and journals. So therefore, thank you Ambassador for coming and we really appreciate your expertise um, on this issue. So how we will proceed, so since Minister has to leave a little bit earlier, uh, because uh, he has a uh, budgetary debate uh, on his shoulders at the moment. So I think, Minister, you should thank uh, us that we are taking you away a little bit from political debate and, 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 and throwing into a more uh, academic uh, and, and, and policy relevant um, uh, discussion. And what I would like to start with, so we will continue on the same more discussion type of a note which was already uh, taken um, uh, during the previous session. And could you please very shortly as a first round of warming ourselves up, uh, what, would bo what would be your vision? What is a uh, security agenda in Central Asian countries? What are main threats? And uh, later on we will switch to what other countries, regional institutions can do there. So now what is your vision of security agenda in five uh, Central Asian countries and in region in general? Minister, could we start with you please? Well, thank you very much <clears throat> and of course thank you for getting me out of the parliament where we are discussing next year's budget. And you just got me out from the most important issue, which is the pay raise for ministers. <laughs> so you may imagine I will be missing the most important part. We will take care of you, don't uh, you? Hopefully. Uh, on, on, on a more serious note, uh, I'm pretty pleased to be here and uh, share some thoughts with you, particularly taking into account that during our presidency of the European Union Council, uh, EU relations with Central Asia uh, have been one of the uh, priorities and I am quite proud of what we have been able to achieve. We have uh, got in June the new EU Central Asia strategy approved. Uh, we have got some good initiatives moving, for instance the high level dialogue on security, uh, the first uh, ever EU Central Asia counterterrorism seminar. So, apart from issues that are related to cooperation in energy sector, apart from uh, cooperation in the education uh, as well as uh, transportation sectors, I think that uh, we have got uh, the renewed uh, EU Central Asia agenda. But uh, obviously one of central issues, and during the presidency on behalf of High Representative Federica Mogherini, I chaired two meetings. One was EU Uzbekistan, and another was EU Kazakhstan. We are also preparing uh, for a broader uh, EU Central Asia meetings uh, later after our presidency. The, one of pressing issues, of course, is the security. And uh, just to be rather short, ministers do not tend to talk in a short manner, so we can take 40 minutes, 45 minutes, but I have very distinguished panelists here who are more experts than I do. From my perspective, I would uh, say that I see three major uh, security challenges. I don't want to speak about threat, but I think that uh, we see the three major security challenges. The first, obviously, that if you talk with representatives of all Central Asian nations and uh, if we look at uh, the situation as it is developing, it is, of course, also raising extremist uh, ideologies, terrorists uh, fight against uh, terrorism, domestic, as well as, of course, uh, some influence from from abroad. And here uh, I do believe that while we all share the same goal that uh, we have to uh, tackle this challenge seriously, of course you have uh, obviously some difficulties because uh, unfortunately 
to some extent, uh, sometimes we cannot uh, define precisely whom we can consider terrorist and whom not. For very different reasons, of course, of uh, uh, also internal political uh, development in every and each of those countries. Uh, second, uh, I do believe that uh, we have to understand that well, we like to speak about the Baltic region, about uh, some uh, Balkan region, some regional cooperation setting. Uh, the relations between Central Asian nations are not as we sometimes tend to understand the regional cooperation. There are definite tensions and I think that uh, one raising issue we have to uh, always remember is the scarcity of resources, particularly water resources. We have seen some tension between countries like uh, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. We have seen the same level of uh, discussion to some extent between Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan. So we should understand also that there are some internal security issues within the region. And uh, I have been talking with all my colleagues, foreign ministers, also with uh, presidents uh, of, of, of many of those countries, uh, offering also some kind of uh, assistance we have developed uh, also within the European Union, for instance. Uh, in the European Union we have some good uh, experience and good uh, lessons learned from how to manage, for instance, uh, rivers and water flows uh, from one country to another country. Um, we have also offered some, some good uh, uh, offices in, 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 let's say, fostering dialogue rather than, uh, let's say, competition or, or confrontation. But I believe that uh, this is one issue we have to really look at uh, as regional uh, security <coughs> challenge, as well as, of course, different level of uh, possible ethnic tensions that can be also sometimes cross-border tensions. So the region itself is not as coherent as sometimes we think, but I would hope that uh, the fact that, for instance, very recently U.S. Secretary of State was visiting Central Asia and meeting with all foreign ministers of Central Asian nations. We have had consultations at the level of Central Asian foreign ministers or deputy foreign ministers and the EU representatives also. There is some kind of uh, dialogue is a positive sign and that should be encouraged. And finally, well, uh, I don't want to go into detail, but I think that we all understand that uh, Afghanistan is still the major issue. And the development within Afghanistan is something that all Central Asian countries are very interested to see as a uh, development in towards, uh, towards stability, uh, towards uh, security. Also, again, because uh, those who have lived in Soviet times still remember the Soviet invasion, also the uh, situation as it was evolving in Central Asian republics. Also now, after 2001, uh, many of Central Asian nations have played a very constructive role. Actually, to some extent, uh, I think that NATO member states have rediscovered Central Asia actually because of the need to provide so-called northern transit route or redistribution network, first to United States troops, then to also other NATO nations. That's how actually more interest was generating in both NATO and then European Union. But then here again, uh, while we see that we all share the same concern about Afghanistan, also, we all understand that sometimes our approach is made different. And that's where we sometimes see also a very different attitudes when you talk with each and other, each and every sorry, uh, representative of, of Central Asia. My final point is that uh, I think that one thing what we should understand very clearly, and sometimes it is not understood by uh, some regional players and some Central Asian nations as well. That we are not, let's say, uh, and here by we I dare to speak as more EU NATO representatives and national representatives, we are not in Central Asia to compete for influence. Uh, 
that's not the goal. And sometimes when we look back at the whole perspective of uh, and prospect of uh, Eastern Partnership, uh, then it was very often viewed as a kind of competition between the EU and the United States on one hand and Russia. This time, uh, I just want to say that we have been always very careful to say that we are not competing with everyone. There are interests uh, in the region of such players as Russia, as China, as India, as, as Iran, uh, economic interests, political interests, uh, also some I would dare to say geopolitical interests, but uh, we don't want to be seen as another competitor. We want to be seen more as uh, the kind of uh, facilitator of, of security process, of better trade relations, uh, economic relations, uh, transportation, uh, as well as to some extent also to promote cultural relations. And I think that uh, this is something that also has to be taken into account uh, when we speak about uh, the overall mm, approach uh, that uh, we take uh, when it comes to, to, to the region. And I was really glad that uh, during our presidency, and of, of course also beyond, Latvia is one of those EU member states that is keen to promote that kind of uh, approach and uh, that uh, this strategy apparently works. It's not a revolutionary kind of, you know, strategy, but it's an incremental approach to a very interesting and very challenging region. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, now I would like to turn uh, uh, the floor to two ambassadors uh, coming from the neighboring region. So we probably would st start with uh, Ambassador Stockton, please. What would be your vision of uh, the security situation in Central Asia? Thank you, Thank you Professor Azulina. For inviting us here. <clears throat> well, I have uh, eight points to make, but I'll make only four points right now, and maybe some more points during the inter intervention. Now, I don't see the scenario ahead very optimistic, because some of the internal, you know, pre-existence uh, unresolved issues are going to be very, very difficult to solve. I don't know whether the EU can intervene in those, but it will make the situation far worse because every ingredient required for a revolution is there in Central Asia, like you saw in Middle East, like uh, Arab Spring or any kind of thing. All the preconditions are there. And I think the succession issue in the next five to six years will trigger the conflict, the internal conflict. The secondly, we have seen the Kunduz event in Afghanistan, the external dimension. You know, the Taliban has come right at the forefront of uh, Tajikistan. Now, 60% of Tajik-Afghan border is extremely porous and affected by Taliban. The reason why the United States had to now stay put through 2017 with 5,500 troops. Mm -hmm. And now you have the specter of ISIS, which has been pursued by Hezbollah Tahrir for the entire Central Asia as a Khilafat. For, for many years, I think 15, 20 years, the HUT, the Hezbollah Tahrir has been pursued. I'm not talking about IMU, uh, Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, but purely HUT has been advocated. What ISIS, of course, through non-violent means, but that was the same goal. Now imagine Central Asia does not have only oil and gas. Afghanistan has also got drugs. This is where the ISIS will be controlling. Therefore, and you have the concept of Khurasan, center at the epicenter of Central Asia. I don't know whether it's hyped, but right now ISIS is the most important discourse of security in Central Asia. And I think now, I see Central Asia becoming a victim, a torn into the conflict between Russia and Turkey. Economically, security point of view, and all sorts of things, I think will be affected, and this becomes a very explosive combination. 
So I, I see the picture quite gloomy. My number two point is that I don't want to talk about the failure and the success of international engagement of the international actors and the regional actors. But let's admit that Central Asia has no security mechanism of its own. There is only one Russian-led collective, se collective security treaty organization. But for the CSTO, you would have seen Arab Spring long time back. There is an umbrella. Therefore, Central Asia cannot, be cannot become Middle East for the time being. Central Asia is also at the back door, I mean, at the, at the, uh, uh, close to the epicenter of terrorism, which is Pakistan and Afghanistan. You had the presence of Al-Qaeda right there in Afghanistan. But it could not make a foot, footing in Central Asia, but it went to South North Africa, which means collective security treaty is working. And that's why you see a lot of internal conflicts have been contained satisfactorily or not satisfactorily. Somehow this has been quite effective. Now what we are seeing is a new synergy between Russia and China. Whether this is a marriage of convenience or we don't know in the long term how this synergy is going to work, but purely byproduct of Ukraine crisis and United States Asia pivot policy. A unique synergy has come into being in Central Asia, which is the European Economic Union, Eurasian Economic Union, and the One Road One Belt. Let's see how it goes. But I'm not very optimistic on this issue. Also, I have a different take on. But point is that Central Asia is now drifting towards China very strongly. And in a country like us, we have no choice. Either you accept Chinese or you accept Islamic extremism in Central Asia. If the Russian dominance is weakening, there is no fourth option. A new reality you must accept, as Excellency has just mentioned, that it's very, I mean, it's not easy to expect quick solution right now in Central Asia. John Kerry's visit has indicated that Americans are now willing for dialogue. He's not talking about a zero sum game, which uh, Excellency has just mentioned, he's talking about engine of growth, he's talking about jobs, growth, connectivity, and manufacturing. Uh, this is a new change, the new security, new dialogue process, new platform for C5 plus 1. I think it's a quite a change. It's a new change, Central Asia 5 plus 1. It's a new process, and uh, how it goes, uh, you know, we will we'll need to see, but this is really a change because it's not an Afghan-centric Central Asia policy. This is where I see I see a change in Central Asian approach, uh, at least also from the European Union perspective. And we have also seen Prime Minister Abe, Prime Minister Modi, Prime Minister of South Korea, many others have rushed to Central Asia recently to redefine Central Asia, not from the zero-sum perspective, but from a totally comprehensive, focused Central Asia policy. And this is a recognition that we cannot narrowly define Central Asia because of conflict in Afghanistan. We have to have far more comprehensive approach. And this is how I see at the moment. But of course, there is a role for European Union. We can deal with this issue. And I'd like to share how India is dealing with this kind of a problem, at least to minimize the negative impact of Central Asia on us. I think we could do it that in the future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the first round. And now I turn the uh, floor to Ambassador Sayan Hart, please. Your view. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Zineta, for this uh, very gracious invitation. And of course, uh, thank you to the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs of Latvia for the invitation. I'm delighted to, to be here. And uh, before I make my opening remarks, let me also congratulate the minister for opening the embassy, Latvian embassy in New Delhi. It was long in coming and I'm glad that uh, when I was here we worked together and uh, it was the last uh, embassy of the European Union in uh, New Delhi. So it's a very welcome addition. Now coming to the subject that we're discussing, particularly as far as the security and stability in Central Asia is concerned, 
I think I would tend to go along with uh, the statements that have been made that, you know, we at times uh, speak of uh, Central Asia as one region, but uh, all the countries are very, very different from each other, whether it is uh, in terms of uh, population, in terms of topography, in terms of level of development, prosperity, etc. So I think that is something that we need uh, to keep in mind when we try to you know, put all these uh, countries uh, together. The other aspect also I think that we need to keep in mind when we are discussing this issue is that uh, none of these countries, these five Central Asian countries, in 1991 when the Soviet Union disintegrated, really wanted to become independent. Independence was handed over to them. Independence was given to them. And in many of the countries, much against their own will. You would see that uh, Kazakhstan was the last uh, country to, uh, to uh, declare independence on the 16th of December 1991, much after even Russia had declared independence in August of 1991. So in that context, uh, uh, the close nexus, the close relations, the close ties with as a part of the Soviet Union and with Russia. I think we need to keep that in mind. The uh, reason basically for this was that, uh, and this has been mentioned uh, in the first panel also, that all these countries are landlocked. And some of them are doubly landlocked in the sense that uh, countries which surround them are themselves also landlocked. For instance, you look at uh, Kazakhstan, you look at Uzbekistan, even their neighbors are also landlocked. So in that sense, you know, the traditional understanding and wisdom used to be that unless you have uh, an outlet to the warm waters, and that is why there used to be the great, the so-called great game in the 19th century between the British and the Russian empires, Russia trying to find uh, warm waters in the south of uh, this region. <coughs> So the wisdom was that unless you had an outlet, unless you had an exit to the warm waters, you would really not be able to survive as an independent, as a viable economy. But I think to the credit, and I definitely don't subscribe to the pessimism that has been articulated, I'm an optimist. And I think what these countries have done, and particularly, you know, since in the morning we have uh, discussed more extensively about Kazakhstan. It is the largest country in area in terms of uh, natural resources. Although I would also say that other countries are also richly endowed, but Kazakhstan, of course, with, you know, as uh, I think the Kazakhs themselves are uh, uh, happy to mention, out of about 110 elements on the Mendeleev's table, they have more than 105 of them in uh, commercially viable quantities, which is uh, great, you know, whether it is uranium, it's iron ore, it's aluminium, it's oil, it's gas, you name it, they have it in. So uh, they have uh, converted this perceived liability of being landlocked into an asset, into an asset through construction, through creation, or what was the earlier uh, silk route, uh, right now having providing that connectivity, which is so very important, which is so very essential. Whether it is through roads, or it is through railroads, or it is through oil pipelines, or it is through gas pipelines. So I think they have, uh, and as was uh, uh, mentioned by uh, uh, the well-known geopolitical scientist uh, Harold McFinder in 1904, that uh, this region, Central Asia region, the country or the countries which dominate this region will, uh, this will serve as the pivot of domination of the world because of uh, the, uh, of, uh, the uh, rapidity of land transport and rail transport as compared to maritime transport. So I think what we are seeing today is a realization of that. Uh, you mentioned about the one belt, one road uh, concept that is coming through. I think as far as India is concerned, we are also looking at whether it is uh, TAPI, the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline. We can discuss about that. I think that uh, the construction of that is going to commence in December. So that is something of we've been uh, 
talking about it for some time, but uh, the first uh, concrete steps are going to be taken. Now, coming to the uh, points that uh, the Honorable Minister, what you have mentioned, I, I think I will uh, uh, definitely uh, agree that water is an issue, but uh, water is an issue which in terms of magnitude, I would consider it to be somewhat of a lesser significance and importance amongst the countries themselves <coughs> than extremism, than terrorism. Because I was in that region, I was uh, uh, very recently and I was invited and the countries of the region are extremely worried at the attractiveness of the Islamic State. A country of uh, 5 million population, Kyrgyzstan, it has had several thousands of people who have gone and joined, uh, joined the ISIS. And I think what uh, really uh, surprises them and also impresses them is that a country of 1.25 billion people, that is uh, a population that is India, with about 160, 170 million uh, Muslims, we have barely uh, people, the numbers who have gone and uh, are known to have associated with ISIS is in the range of about 15, 20, 25, not more than that. I Meaning we have seen also in uh, France the attacks that have taken place uh, uh, earlier this month. There also you've had about 1,500 to 2,000 people who have gone and who have had training in, uh, uh, in uh, Syria and in Iraq. And so I think this is an issue that <coughs> is uh, uh, consuming them, uh, particularly some of the countries and uh, some of them would like to identify it with level of <coughs> poverty, but I don't think it is uh, in that sense, you know, there can be a direct correlation between uh, uh, going and joining the terrorist groups and poverty, because uh, you have, uh, even from prosperous uh, nations, France and other countries of Europe, you have had people going there. I think it's more of ideology. So I think while uh, promoting economic uh, well-being and economic prosperity is uh, an important aspect, but I think if we want to deal with the ideology of ISIS, I think it, we will have to create a counter narrative, a counter ideology which will need to be, uh, which will need to be shared. And I think this is something that we in India have been working on, India we have been focusing on, and I think this is something that we can uh, sort of, you know, definitely speak about. The other aspect, of course, is uh, Afghanistan. I think the Central Asian region has been a beneficiary of the involvement of uh, NATO, uh, United States and ISIF forces in uh, Afghanistan. All of them have been beneficiaries. I, I would say even uh, countries like uh, China and countries like Russia and India have also been beneficiaries of the NATO engagement in Afghanistan. Because while NATO and the US forces were engaged there, I think all the countries, particularly countries like China, and they have had the time to build up their own economies, their own uh, strengths, so that now they are in a position even to challenge the United States. But I think as the United States <coughs> and uh, NATO ISA forces uh, withdraw from there, the responsibility will have to be shouldered by the regional organizations. And there, as you mentioned, the data, we can sort of you know, come to that a little later. But the point I want to make here is that if you look at the condition in Central Asia in 1991, 92, 93, 94, immediately after independence, and if you look at the situation now, I think you will find that in level, in terms of level of prosperity, well-being, all the countries are much better. Number two, meaning, I, and I could give examples. You know, meaning if you look at uh, Kazakhstan, the, and you can say that the uh, population is small, 16.9 or 17 million, but the per capita GDP, nominal dollar terms, is 13,000. Purchasing power parity terms. $24,000 per capita, which is a significant figure. If you look at even uh, Uzbekistan, it is about purchasing power uh, uh, PPP uh, per capita GNP is about 5,800, which is something similar to uh, what we have in India. 
If you look at Turkmenistan, it is uh, nominal uh, GDP is 8,000. So these are good uh, uh, figures in terms of development. I agree that there is a question mark in terms of succession. What happens? But the, it is the presence of these leaders, whether it is uh, uh, Nazarbay or it is Islam Karimov or it is Rahmanov in Tajikistan that has provided the stability and the security. They might not have the, the most vibrant uh, democracies as uh, you know people in the West might wish to think, but I think in terms of security and in terms of stability, and uh, even in Turkmenistan, whether it was uh, Niyazov and now it is uh, uh, Bardi Mohamedov, you know, it has been a smooth uh, transition. So I, uh, that is a question mark, but I am not overtly worried. Because if you look at uh, how things uh, will evolve and at the level of, uh, of economic development that they have been able to reach, that they should be able to manage this. I agree that the second rung leadership, second rung succession has not been put into position. So uh, as far as the water issue is concerned, I agree. But uh, here also we have to see that uh, the problems in the Aral Sea, they have been able to manage to quite some extent. I think in 2008-2009, Mr. Minister, the, the situation was that the Aral Sea had uh, lost about 80% to 90% of its water. But after that, with the assistance of uh, World Bank, they have been able to uh, uh, re-energize and uh, 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 bring it uh, significantly back to what it was. I think the water issue that is going to really challenge them and affect them is the sharing of waters with China. Because from China, you have the, uh, whether it is the uh, river Ili coming in, which finds its way uh, up to uh, through Kazakhstan and goes to Russia. I think that is what is going to become the more <coughs> challenging of the aspects. So let me uh, stop here with my initial comments and of course we we'll come back. Thank you very much again. The list is getting longer and longer. So therefore I'm looking forward for, for European perspective. So what you will add to this list. I would add to the list only one thing, but I will rearrange a little bit before adding this only one point. The, the spectrum of priorities. First of all, I, I agree with the minister and with the other speakers that uh, the challenge of the, the, the attraction of the, the Islamic State is big, and this is probably one of the few things that we have in common, Europe and Central Asia. We don't know why young people from Central Asia and why, why young people from, from uh, Europe are so attracted by the Islamic State. I don't know if anybody in this room has watched the last Mad Max, the movie. Nobody has watched it. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So when I watched it, I was uh, in, I watched it in Paris with a friend of mine who is a journalist, and we had the same reaction coming out of that. We thought, is this is the Islamic State? Young people put out in the desert sands with big machines, with guns, with the possibility to enslave women for their sexual ambitions or whatever. Is it that which is attracting young people? It's very interesting what you mentioned about India and I think it would be worth having a good analysis why it has not happened. So this is a big challenge. It is a big challenge for us. It is a big challenge for Central Asia. Now for us and for me as a French citizen, in spite of what we went through in Paris, I'm not, I'm not worried about the future of the French state. I'm not even worried about the future of Schengen. I think Schengen might be put into parentheses for a while and in some places. And I'm not at all worried for the future of the EU. But if you ask me, am I worried for the future of the Central Asian states? Yes, I am. And I would share mainly your views. For all the reasons you've named, I think, except for Kyrgyzstan, in all the other states, and I'm sorry, you're a diplomat, but I had to smile a little bit when you said that in Turkmenistan, the transition between Turkmenbashi and Berdy Mohamedov were smooth. What do you mean? You're frightening me a little bit. This is the kind of transition I would like to see in New Delhi. No, <laughs> of course not. But if you, if, you, if you look at these four states out of five in Central Asia, you have uh, um, regimes there that are, in the best of cases, <coughs> so the best of cases probably Kazakhstan, you have regimes that do not allow for a political spectrum to take space in the country. 
And so your, your, your comparison with the Arab state is striking to me. The day these regimes fall down, you don't have any other structure capable to deal with the transition than those who are close to the mosque, than those who have been able to work underground. And of course, the lay normal political parties are not capable of doing that. Look at Egypt. You had Mr. Mubarak for how many? 30 years telling the United States, if it's not me, it will be them. Them meaning the, the, the Muslim brothers, who were still in the frame of political Islam, I would say, the most correct, who could have succeeded in government, but we've seen what they've done, right? And then, of course, he destroys all the other parties. They're all either in jail or in exile. And then he falls down, who wins the election first. And there you had elections in other countries. It might happen without elections, but at gone point, right? Who wins the elections? Those who have been capable for years to work through, you know, unofficial networks. And so if you take, with the exception of Kyrgyzstan, this is the situation in all five countries there. And on top of that, you have, particularly in Uzbekistan, a huge part of the young population which doesn't see future for them in this kind of state. And they are attracted by Ismuk Tahir, which is also preaching a caliphate, which is also preaching, their in and then I come to my list, to the destruction of the existing borders. But they claim to be nonviolent, and I don't think there are proofs up to now that members of Ismuk Tahir has, have been violent. But mentally, they prepare the ground for these young people to join IS or the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan or whatever, to go on to, on to fight to Afghanistan. But then, the, my last point is the point of the borders. The borders inherited from the Soviet Union are extremely complicated everywhere. But in Central Asia, come on, look only at one place, the Fergana Valley. The different enclaves you have there, the water issues with the Uzbek army ready to march in if the Kyrgyz had the bad idea one year not to let the water flow down when the Uzbeks need to flood their cotton fields, right? Um, and then you have someone else who is, on that sense, saying that borders inherited from the, you know, the Soviet Union are not untouchable. You see whom I mean, the president of Russia. Mr. Putin, by, by treating Ukraine the way he did, by changing in Europe uh, so many years after the Second World War, borders by military means, has triggered something into the former Soviet space which is extremely dangerous. And his ideologues and those who preach this new ideology of the Russian world are sending a, such an awkward message to Kazakhstan in particular. And I don't know whether any of you here have done the job I've done in Moscow, just going around, talking to my usual friends and contacts, either in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or in the, the world of uh, political parties and asking them, what is, what is the Russian world? Is it Novorossiya? In private, you get a pretty clear answer. It is, of course, Novorossiya. It is the north of Kazakhstan. So by doing that, Russia, which has, I think, a vocation, and it has been mentioned here, to be a stabilizing factor, militarily at least, for Central Asia, is in a way not completely playing itself out of the picture, but making someone like President Nazarbayev, who has been certainly the most faithful and skillful allied to Russia, thinking two things. A, Mr. Putin is bellicose. B, he's not quite reliable. I would add even unreliable. And third, and th that will be the end of my list, if you look at the last time we had great security challenges in Central Asia, what happened? First time was the civil war in Tajikistan. Second time were the pogroms in, um, in uh, southern Kyrgyzstan in 2010. You remember the Kyrgyz president, Mrs. Antumbayeva, begging in Vienna in front of the Council of the OSC, almost on her knees, for anybody to intervene, including Russia. Who intervened? Nobody. So just imagine what will happen the day you have a greater challenge, right? And there, again, with this new situation we are in since Ukraine, I have, uh, you forgot to mention in my biography that the most challenging job I have had and the nicest 
was that I spent as schizophrenic, by the way. I spent five years in Tashkent, uh, four years in Tashkent as the director of something called the Open Society Institutes. <laughs> that was schizophrenic but nice, right? Uh, but the, 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 the new situation now with Uzbekistan being very worried with waters, and I don't think water would be an easy thing to deal with in the future. You're right up to now. All these presidents are all coming from the same school, they've all been to the party school, they all speak Russian, and even when, when things get tough, they can sit down and have a glass of vodka, eat the gavarimsa, okay? I don't think that will happen with the next generation. That, that will be quite different. And you have this, um, this powerful Uzbek army. Uzbekistan has the most powerful army in the region, which in 2010, during the pogroms in southern Kyrgyzstan, behaved very nicely. Karimov did not march in. If you take the same situation in Crimea, I asked people in Moscow and, and you know, people in the, whom I know, in the Gos Duma and in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, can you give me the name of one single Russian family whose house has been burned in Crimea? Or, by the way, who has been killed? Of course, they can't because there was no one, right? Whereas in, in Osh, what happened is that over one day you had 150,000 Uzbek, um, uh, ethnic Uzbeks crossing over to Uzbekistan. Karimov, if there was one time in my life that I could praise Tashkent for its foreign policy, it was in that occasion. Karimov said these are all internal issues of Kyrgyzstan. I don't move. He opened the borders and he opened the camps immediately to ICRC and UNHCR. Now, would any of the, these countries react the same after what Russia has done with Crimea? In cases when one of their ethnic minorities in the neighborhood country will be treated again as it happened in Osh, without using the military tool. It's an open question, but I think that the new situation created in the CIS by Russia is having there a very big long-term effect and a very destabilizing one. And the last one I would like to, to make is that China, I think China is a, on its land borders is mainly behaving as a, an economic, a trade power. On its uh, sea borders, it's a bit different, right? But, uh, you know, it's the first time in the 5,000 years history of uh, China that it has signed concrete border agreements with uh, that central part of the continent, right? And uh, if you look at the infrastructures, if you look at the map of Central Asia, the infrastructures 25 years ago, Basically, all the roads, the railways, the gas, uh, well, the pipelines were all going north. If you look at them today, they're all going east. You know, the roads, the railways, the, all the investments that China is making. So I see China as a, a power in the region that could really be a uh, helper to uh, enforce stability. But militarily, it will, I don't think it will be China. I think in problems, it should be the CSTO, if the CSTO is means business. And I think NATO has the wrong approach, has had the wrong approach by treating the CSTO as it has been treating up to now. I think in the region, there are not too many security organizations. They are too few. Thank you. Thank you very much. It looks that uh, the first round uh, was quite a difficult exercise to trying to put uh, or at least on one uh, <coughs> list of, of uh, one piece of page uh, the whole extensive uh, setting and uh, different complexes of threats or challenges in the region. But I think that now will be the more difficult question, actually, uh, from my side. <coughs> so uh, if you put on the list challenges, um, the next step is to look at what policies to be applied. What are tools which could stabilize uh, the situation in Central Asia in um, short-term, mid-term, or long-term perspective? So because it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter so much either you are optimist or pessimist at the present moment. It's clear that the complexity of the security fabric in, in, in uh, Central Asia 
is one of the challenges for countries, for the region, for the European Union and for neighbours as well. So could I ask you in a very telegraphic manner, try to put forward some ideas what India as a neighbour, uh, European Union, European member states could do to stabilise this region. Could we start again in the same uh, order, Minister? What you would propose? You are so optimistic about Latvian presidency in the EU. Uh, well, look, I think that we, we are doing some mistakes all over again. Uh, we somehow want sometimes to rush to save the world. Everywhere and, and we think that uh, uh, the kind of European Union or you know, broader Central Atlantic community uh, has obligation or resources or ability to interfere in Africa wherever there are any conflicts. Okay, sometimes do occasionally to interfere everywhere, asked or, or not asked. But I think that we have to <coughs> pursue some strategies that actually are very important uh, to somehow um, strengthen the overall fabric of, of each and every nation in Central Asian region and the region as a whole. First, one thing that we probably were not touching so much upon, but what is very important, and Ambassador here, I was referring to terrorism as issue number one in my list, and only then comes all other things. But uh, all of those uh, countries actually are very secular countries. To some extent, uh, all the presidents, all the governments of those countries are pursuing more secular agenda rather than a kind of, you know, uh, more uh, religion oriented and we have some very good ways how we can assist and what is the fact we are doing for instance strengthening uh, with by the way a very strong support from uh, some of governments like Uzbekistan, Tajikistan strengthening uh, for instance uh, institutions that are strengthening the secular uh, let's say society that's uh, gender equality we have NGOs working on, on women's rights, understanding that this is not going to be an easy task or this is going to be something that you can achieve in one year or five years, but I think that this is one of the things where cooperating with those countries we can really strengthen this uh, fabric of society. Second, uh, well, uh, I think that sometimes uh, our uh, policies of uh, engaging with countries uh, through the uh, dialogue on, on, on human rights is either biased or sometimes simply wrong. We tend to issue press releases, we don't do sometimes too much quiet diplomacy, but I think that we can, and there are some good examples through the dialogue we have, and I chair too, as I said, with Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, we can advance also some of this agenda uh, to mitigate some of the very, very difficult issues that we all see. And here again, we shouldn't be uh, too much oriented on double standards. We sometimes tend to criticize regions and nations. We are not really interested and in cooperate with the other nations and regions that have the same issues of human rights, political freedoms, and all of a sudden we are great friends. And even one of my colleagues in the beginning of this year, when she got a bit too critical about another big issue, had to retract to some extent. So this is something where we have to find the right balance, how we, on one hand, pursue some, let's say, more uh, liberal, more democratic agenda, while not spoiling too much of, of, of the whole relations. And finally, uh, you know, it's again uh, the great experience we have had. I would say actually they have had in 1990s as European Union and United States vis a vis Russia, and we have had vis a vis Eastern Partnership. We somehow either try to demonize the one of, or another person, a leader, or to make a saint, and then we fail in both. I think that our approach has to be that we have to engage in a way that we talk 
with everyone, but we don't put too much emphasis on that or another. It's a leader uh, trying to somehow preserve also all channels of uh, communication. So, what do you can do? I already said we had uh, some of uh, good uh, ideas where we have tried to get and those who were saying that countries in Central Asia are very different and we need to have individual approach. At the same time, we have found that at least there are two issues where we can really get all countries sitting around the same table. One was counter-terrorism effort. For the first time uh, at the beginning of this year, they all were sitting at the same table with the EU trying to devise some counter-terrorism strategies, more cooperation, more information sharing, uh, and so on. And second, uh, I do believe that uh, there is a real interest to have also some of EU modernization programs being applied in, in all of those. Apart from one country, uh, all actually have been interested in closer cooperation when it comes to modernization of their education system. Those are all long-term engagements, but we should also understand that uh, the approach that we can come in to solve all problems is not going to work, that's for Central Asia, but also we have to engage with all key regional actors. I mentioned some of them. Thank you for adding also Japan, Korea, I can add also further Turkey, Pakistan, all the regional countries where you can find the need to, to cooperate more. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Stockdown, uh, you said that you prepared also the second list where you will continue with right. India, India. Could you? But could you please do in a telegraphic way because there are already hands raised? Oh, okay, sure, sure. <laughs> well, all of us got states in Central Asia, different but also similar. Perhaps the European Union has got more stakes. You have the energy, you have the drugs, you have the terrorism, and also you have the refugee. Supposing you have a crisis in Central Asia, where will these people go? They're not going to go to Pakistan or China. They're all going to rush to Turkey or Europe. So this is a very much a possibility that you need to consider. Secondly, please don't get into conflict management. Issues like border, Ethnic issues and the water issues are so complicated, even Russians do not want to intervene. Or they don't want to intervene. It, it's very, very complicated. It only adds to the problem. Now, EU has some good programs. I think your economic programs are very good, like econo uh, partnership with uh, Kazakhstan, <coughs> uh, $38 billion or $40 billion, extremely good. Some of the education programs, the capacity building programs are extremely good. And those things must be, uh, must be uh, taken ahead. Uh, secondly, we have limitations. We can't match the Chinese and the Russians in Central Asia. We have a lot of limitations. Somebody mentioned about connectivity, accessibility and all that. But we don't talk about democracy. We don't talk about human rights. But we do everything to facilitate democracy. Training them. Get into parliamentary debate take them into United Nations bodies. So I've seen many European countries tend to support European partners, European friends. We support the Central Asian candidate for any elections in the UN just to get them exposure. We train them in United Peacekeeping Mechanism. We train them in so many things so that they also understand what is third world country, what is developing country, in order to get them outside the Russian fold. So there are experiment, many experiments you can do to make them more uh, confident and to develop a sense of ownership, sense of responsibility in their own security. Now, another our approach is instead of being outside the mechanism, please be inside the mechanism. You can't leave it to the Russians and the Chinese to do everything what they want to do. So we want to become a member of SEO. Uh, we just become a member, not member, we have a free trade now with the Eurasian Economic Union. We haven't said yes to one belt, one road as yet, but eventually we will do. The idea is to be inside, you know what to do. You can moderate, you can, you know, soften the whole process rather than being outside and take confrontation as view. So this is our mechanism. The idea is to create an alternative model. 
a safety cushion, you know, safety value in the future, so that you can at least minimize the damage or the negative impact that might have on us. I don't know about the European Union. I'm sure you also do a lot of things. My only submission here for the European Union is there are clear-cut projects. Now people are talking about Islam and terrorism. Talking about ISIS and fundamentalism is one thing. But talking about Islam in Central Asia is another thing. Please make it very clear. Central Asian Islam is not the Islam that you see elsewhere. We had a traditional Central Asian Islam, unfortunately, because of aggressive Soviet oppression, of killing the Sufism, now you have the revivalism. The Soviets did a very bad things to overtly killing the, the, the Islam. So you have the reaction now from the Wahhabis, Salafis, uh, the Tablikis, and all sorts of uh, schools have come up. And enough damage has been done to Central Asia in the name of Islam. Now please, we can still rescue Central Asia. Don't allow Central Asia be uh, infected by this what is going on in Syria and Iraq. And that is possible if you nurture Sufism, because Sufism is based on spiritualism. It's not on, based on political ideas, like Khilafat and all that kind of things. So we have a lot of assets. We have a lot of resources. What to do with Sufism? Now, if you can get into projects, there are various Sufi schools in uh, Central Asia, uh, dozens of them. Any one of them, just pick up Uzbekistan, or in Tajikistan, or even Kyrgyzstan in Osh or Fergana anywhere, you can take a few projects. How Sufism can be revived? That's the best solution. So for that, you need resources, expertise, and clear-cut focused projects. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Sayakar, what about your ideas? Okay, my ideas, I think, uh, as I mentioned, you know, just uh, take off uh, that uh, the West, NATO, US, ISAF did uh, uh, enough during, uh, you know, from 2001 onwards till now to deal with Afghanistan. Now I think it is the uh, turn of the regional countries to step up to the plate. And by that I mean uh, India, I mean China, I mean uh, Russia, I mean Iran, Turkey, Central Asian states, etc. Now if you look at the experience of what has happened over the last uh, uh, one year plus, uh, because that is when 2014, that is when NATO has uh, started uh, uh, withdrawing and uh, what uh, the uh, new president in Afghanistan, Ashraf Ghani, he came and he said that he's going to work along with Pakistan and along with China to deal with the Taliban threat. But, and you know, the two demands that he had made, number one is that the attacks by Taliban in Afghanistan would come down and number two that Pakistan would be able to deliver Taliban to the negotiating table so as to be able to talk with them. But none of these has uh, succeeded. It's been already more than a year. None of this has succeeded. There was just one meeting, I think, in July or something with Taliban, and that is also with the second round leadership. So I think it is really time for the, uh, uh, for the regional countries to come in and to start working <coughs> that. So far it has been, you know, and that meeting also took place in uh, Pakistan, in Mori in Pakistan. So if we are saying that the peace process, the negotiating process has to be Afghan-led, Afghan-owned and in Afghanistan's interest, then why should it be taking place outside Afghanistan? It should be taking place in Afghanistan. So I think all these countries and particularly, you know, since the United States is also going to be there for some time, all these countries need to be. I think also in terms of, like here in the case of dealing with ISIS, and at uh, Antalya in Turkey, uh, US and uh, Russia said we will deal with uh, ISIS, we will work together. I think here also when we are dealing with a common adversary, with a common enemy, I think both the United States and Russia can really come on the same side, uh, on the same platform, be together and work on this. The, we need to take also sort of, you know, as far as, uh, and I agree with you, Minister, when you said that these are secular, these are not the Wahhabi Salafi sect of Islam that is there. Actually, Sufism came out uh, in the 11th century from Tur Turkestan in the south of Kazakhstan, and that is how it uh, uh, got to the other, other parts of the world. So I think it is something that has emanated, that has originated from that area. Rather than and if you look at the 
policy and the approach that, uh, let's say, India had in the case of uh, Myanmar, for instance. You know, we were not, uh, while the world, the United States in particular, was criticizing Myanmar from the rooftops. I think our engagement with uh, Myanmar was behind the scenes, advising them and telling them that the way to move forward is to open up transparency and democracy. And that is what we see over a short period of about four years, from 2011 to 2015 when we had the elections recently. I think there's been such a, a remarkable change. So I think in, uh, in uh, uh, Central Asia, that, uh, that is the way that we need to approach. The other is in the area of education, because you know when we are talking about a change in the mindset, a change in the mental attitude, I think the, the most important, the most uh, powerful agent of transformation is education. So I think in terms of uh, collaborating with them, education, capacity development, and we have hundreds, India has hundreds and thousands of uh, 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 people who are also in Af from Afghanistan, we got them, whether it was parliamentarians, whether it was in different areas, whether it is skill development or it is in these areas. And so also we do it with the Central Asia also. And I think that is uh, something that we can the other aspect, one last uh, uh, element that I will mention is through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. We have become a member of Shanghai Cooperation Organization 2016, the meeting in uh, Uzbekistan, in Tashkent, we will take over. And I think that will give us an opportunity because uh, Central Asia has today been identified as a strategic uh, uh, partner, strategic importance. That's why. Our Prime Minister went to all the five countries in July of this year to establish a personal rapport. And in those countries, we have seen it is the personal rapport with the top leadership. Thank you very, very much. Uh, more or less, you were also supporting those arguments we were mentioned before. Uh, but Mr. Delatro, you belong to this uh, pessimistic uh, group of presenters. So what would be your... Well, I try not to be pessimistic, but just analytical, right? Uh, <laughs> sorry. For our perspective from Europe, first of all, I take the opportunity before the Minister runs to defend the budget of his ministry to um, uh, underline the, the great job that uh, Latvia has done during your presidency to review this EU Central Asia strategy. I think you've been really hands-on. And you've brought into the discussion also civil society sectors from Central Asia, which had not been done by, by your predecessors in this. Now, I think this EU Central Asia um, uh, strategy is good, but uh, I, we have to know that the EU impact in Central Asia is quite modest. Just to take two figures, the level of China's involvement, China is putting in the region 40 billions, the EU, the strategy, if I'm not mistaken, is one billion over seven years. Now, if you talk, you talk with the people in the region, they don't expect any security stuff from the EU. They see that when in Europe things are burning, like in Ukraine, it's not Mrs. Mogherini who is stepping in, but Mrs. Merkel and François Hollande, right? They see, they see quite clearly what the Normandy uh, framework means for Mrs. Mogherini and the External Action Service in Brussels. But the other thing as a NATO member, I think because of the, 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 the explosive situation in which the, 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 the world is, I think, I think what I already mentioned before, NATO has now to stop accusing CSTO of being a, a new Cold War setup, when at the end of the day you could say people in NATO who react like that may be still in a Cold War framework. I think it is time to exchange notes on Central Asia between the two organizations. My big question is whether the Russians mean business with, the, with CSTO. And in 2010 in Kyrgyzstan, clearly they did not mean business. But if they mean business, if they are serious about that, there will be a need for interventions in the region, unfortunately. There will be destabilizations of some of the most fragile, fragile states. And my last point on education and kind of EU soft power I think again in the strategy it was, it was very well thought out to re-engage most of the EU money towards Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan is the only democracy. It is still a little bit a chaotic democracy, but okay. You know, it was just of a coffee break we were mentioning this uh, 
this uh, association between the Respublica Party and uh, and that I used to get the government. Okay, you could say, okay, Berlin is also a chaotic democracy because you have a cross coalition or whatever. Uh, but but really, putting the money in these two, Tajikistan is a bit different, of course, but in Tajikistan, there are some openness and external money can make a difference provided they are well in, well engaged and, and a good follow-up is, is being done. And on education, I agree very much, I think, particularly for Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. I don't see any possibility with these two countries to engage uh, deeply now, except of continuing having our contacts there, having profs with, uh, with them and showing our love and friendship for them. But education, having people from these two countries getting education abroad, coming back with uh, some views of what yeah. the world is and how you can run properly a country. And on Kazakhstan, I think Kazakhstan is more at the political level. I would say that on Kazakhstan, Nazarbayev is probably one of the, the smartest uh, presidents in the region. And he could be convinced, but maybe I'm too optimistic now and too naive. But I think he could, or at least he should be convinced by all the states represented here, including Turkey and India, that it is time for him to prepare his succession. And, and I know the Russians have been doing that, right? Basically, he has this younger generation around. He has a load, unlike uh, Berli Muhammadov or Karimov, to have a younger generation being out there with a voice which is not always the Nazarbayev voice. And now he should be really encouraged to carry on. Otherwise, the, the succession there and in Tashkent are, for me, the two biggest question marks for the region and possibly the most disruptive question marks. Thank you very much. Now it's time for questions. So I see already two hands, three. We could take all three questions together because the minister has to leave and then uh, the panel will answer. So please, Ambassador, we'll stop. Oh, okay. Then, okay, sorry, the lady behind you. Yeah, yeah. okay. Ilo Taladze, director, uh, director of Marta Resource Center for Women. I just wanted to ask you how do you see the role of civil society? Uh, in this region, in these countries, in uh, combating uh, organized crime, prevention of radicalization, and generally, how to say, facilitating security. Thank you. Now, Ambassador, please. So, the report, society. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to congratulate all the speakers because they really went deep into the subject, and I think they covered all aspects. And I'd especially like to praise the Latvian presidency for putting Central Asia among its priorities. I think it's really relevant. I also praise them for promoting this new strategy approach <coughs> uh, towards Central Asia, uh, in which, of course, uh, the higher representative and ex-foreign minister of Italy, Mogherini, played a, a huge uh, important role. I think, really, the involvement of EU is some last speaker has been critical about that, uh, but it really depends on the support that it gets from the EU public opinions, also the ones coming from Southern Europe, for instance. Um, we Italians have been greatly involved in Afghanistan, which sent in the past nearly 1,000 troops, now there are quite a few hundred still. Uh, the idea is, of course, to pacify the area, and, and, uh, and but also, of course, uh, stopping terrorism, and fighting drug trafficking, in which, of course, our sometimes uh, some organized crime uh, organizations are involved. So, really, I think it was of paramount importance to send this new positive look uh, with the new strategy towards the area and um, really make uh, the public opinions in the South understand that it's important to be there that Central Asian countries can cooperate also to stop terrorism and drug trafficking. Of course, education is a fundamental mean. This issue of eradicating drug cultures in Afghanistan is, is really a difficult one, but uh, I think we're on the right, right track. That's all. Thanks. Thank you very much. Then please pass my here, and then we'll go to you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marc Dominch, the Google of Latvia, and uh, I would like also to thank uh, all panelists for a very comprehensive and deep uh, analysis 
uh, I would like to uh, underline uh, also Latvian initiatives uh, also during uh, taken during the presidency of Latvia in uh, EU Council and uh, uh, and at this point I would like to mention BOMCA border management program in Central Asia program which uh, Latvia uh, agreed to undertake responsibility this is long lasting uh, uh, border security uh, management program in Central Asia. It's already ninth phase, and uh, uh, formerly uh, it was implemented uh, by U United Nations Development Program. And uh, this year, it's the uh, first time when this three-year-long program will be led by a consortium of EU uh, of one of uh, uh, of EU countries, so under uh, Latvian lead. Uh, and uh, we have four consortium <coughs> consisting of four of four countries and. Uh, uh, one international organization and uh, several Latvian uh, uh, agencies involved border, border security. Um, and uh, uh, I would like also, uh, my question uh, probably is in overall context of our discussion, uh, what's your opinion uh, uh, as a specialist uh, uh, working uh, quite long time in the, in the region, uh, also on the, uh, with the questions related to the region, uh, what is uh, uh, impact. What uh, is a contribution of the international organizations uh, in the field of uh, bringing uh, uh, border security by uh, different uh, capacity building uh, uh, projects? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And please speak. Olga Spaza, Sciences Po again. Um, yeah, I'd like to build on the last point that Ambassador Sajan Har has mentioned. <clears throat> the fact that the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization is getting bigger and growing uh, due to a membership, new membership of India and Pakistan this was decided this year and I had already the pleasure to discuss with you during the coffee break. Now I'd like to know the opinions of the other panelists, um, especially since I was wondering already why the Shanghai Cooperation Organization was not so much mentioned. Is that because it is not really considered to be an effective organization format to deal with security threats in the region or because it was just forgotten and now that we have these new members is that rather do you think um, something that could dynamize this organization whose performance so far was rather modest in security terms or is it a rather risk that it could be even further paralyzed yeah thank you uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, excellent questions. So, Minister has to go after a moment, so probably we could give floor first to Minister to answer, but I would encourage probably divide those questions among you, not to repeat one by one and answering all those four questions. So you could pick uh, what you would like out of those questions and then uh, to respond to that one. So we have the role of civil society uh, in security sector. Uh, then we have the role of public opinion of thousand countries and indeed if for instance I refer to Latvian public opinion polls and in terms of uh, recipient countries of development cooperation Central uh, Asian countries go as a second ones after Eastern partnership countries so in, in, in the Baltic states I think we are more or less okay with our public opinion uh, so then there was a question about international organizations in border management issues and also role of Shanghai uh, cooperation organization. So, Minister, please, let's start with you. Well, that's an easy one now, because on, on, on Marta's uh, question, I actually already answered in my previous intervention, I think that <coughs> everything that NGOs can do to strengthen, to strengthen secular societies and also to, to assist in any way they can, it's, uh, it's already being done, and uh, Marta itself provides an excellent example of that. Uh, on public opinions, you know, I think that one issue that we haven't mentioned, but which immediately can wake up any public opinion within the European Union immediately, is migration. So just let's tell our publics that if something goes terribly wrong in Central Asia, being bad transition, the overall explosion, then... Uh, I think we all understand that there is going to be another source of migration everywhere, also touching Europe. And I think that uh, that is something that uh, we always should uh, remember. By the way, one of 
uh, steel sources of migration, we are all affected, is Afghanistan. And people from Afghanistan are in Italy, are in Greece, are in Turkey, as far as I know. They are entering also, trying to enter Latvia, uh, crossing the Russian Latvian, the Russian Latvian border, and so on. So this is something where you can easily wake up uh, every public in Europe, and I think that this is something that uh, we should also underline. If we don't address issues now, we are in the process of getting possible uh, trouble. Well, I will not go into Bonka. I think this is something that is a very good example of how we actually are also helping to address some of those challenges. And on Chaka organization and CSTO. Uh, I think that Shanghai organization, first of all, is still the cooperation organization where, sorry to say, but China and Russia is still trying to balance both to some extent. If it may come to the kind of, uh, uh, you know, also the solver of some security challenges, fine. But I think this is a bit uh, balancing organization between two powers that uh, really are interested in, in, in the region. On this CSTO, well, look, uh, I think that uh, we still have to understand uh, how serious this organization is. Uh, because, frankly, if you have Uzbekistan suspending the membership, suspending, if you have all those issues that uh, we are now facing in Ukraine, if we do see that basically this organization is very much uh, uh, very much Russia's oriented, then I still reserve some some benefit of the doubt whether uh, any kind of formal exchanges uh, or discussions would, would help or not, but I have a benefit of doubt. I have to deeply apologize for running out. It's not that I want to escape further questions or the criticism from my panel <laughs> members. You can do that freely when I leave, but uh, unfortunately this is a bit uh, tense day also here in, 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 in Riga in Parliament. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Minister, for coming. So we will excuse you, but we still have some five, seven minutes to go to give the floor also to other speakers to respond to, to, respond to questions. Actually, we started 10 minutes late. So but don't minutes. forget you have lunch too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so very no, difficult thing. No more than seven minutes. So. <laughs> Good luck. We have lunch for lunch. Yes. <laughs> and then we will offer lunch indeed. Yeah. Great pleasure. No. So, uh, please, who would like to respond? Yes, please. Well, on CSCO, uh, first of all, I'm not surprised that someone from Sciences Po is asking that. <laughs> no, I'm joking because I'm a former student from Sciences Po. I, I would agree with what the minister said. I think it is potentially a great organization and potentially it gathers, you know, when you have an organization having in it only China and India, I don't want to be despective of the other ones, but you cannot say it's not a strong organization, right? But concretely on Central Asia, I haven't seen up to now much concrete outputs, but I think the potential is there. We just have to see. I've seen summits taking place in Central Asia, which was great for these countries, the countries that hosted this summit, but in terms of concrete output up to now, as a CEO, no, I haven't seen. On civil society, uh, civil society is very diverse in Central Asia. There are two countries where it is practically destroyed. One is Uzbekistan, the other one is uh, Turkmenistan. Uh, then you have one country in which uh, it is very strong. It is uh, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, and I think in Kyrgyzstan it will remain strong for what one of the speakers this morning already mentioned, for the reasons that any government there knows that they can be ousted by the street, you know. And I think when you know that, you're careful with civil society. And I think also in Tajikistan, Tajikistan, it's, it's, it, you have also strong potentials there. And for our democ democratic states to engage in the region is to support politically and also financially civil society indeed. But you see that uh, even in Kyrgyzstan, you have a legislation coming up in Parliament uh, which is quite similar to what Putin has done in Russia with his uh, foreign agents and all that. So, uh, for the moment, my best wish is to civil society in the region. You have quite courageous actors there. Some are in jail, some are in exile, um, and I think the future will be 
tough, but without a strong civil society, it's difficult to build after afterwards a real uh, modern state. And I, I have some experience of working in Latin America also, and I think you have been there too, right? Uh, if you look in, in Latin America after the dictatorships, the military dictatorships of the 70s, the countries that really emerged quickly as building a, um, you know, sustainable states are indeed those in which even under the, the military governments they managed to keep some kind of civic society in a place like Chile, it was clearly through the Catholic Church that opposed the regime, unlike in Argentina where the bishops were quite clearly on the side of the military. And uh, for Central Asia, I think it's the big question for, 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 the, for the future, and there are too many of them, of those good, good people who are now in exile in our countries. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that we will have still time to discuss different issues over lunch, yeah? So please, Ambassador. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, let me very quickly come to a couple of these questions. First to the SCO. You know, the SCO, as we were discussing over uh, the tea break also, it started off basically to settle borders between China and all the Central Asian states and Russia. So earlier, when it was uh, put into position in 1997-96, it was Shanghai 5. That means China, Russia, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. It has settled the borders. So basically, that was the idea, and to ensure that the uh, Uyghur movement, you know, the uh, East Turkestan movement, that they would not create problems as far as the China neighboring areas. So as far as the purpose, the mandate of uh, Shanghai, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, it became that in 2001 with the inclusion of Uzbekistan. So that was settled, but after that it has been expanding its role, expanding its role to deal with terrorism, to deal with extremism, and of course as far as economic, you know, whether it is connectivity or energy, etc. Now what uh, you say, I agree with you that it has the potential, but it has not uh, really delivered because it has not been asked to deliver so far. They have been organizing these peace, peace mission exercises in China, in Russia, in Yekaterinburg, with participation of forces from all these countries. I think the time has come now for it really to act in some way. It has been holding these meetings on Afghanistan for the last, I think, uh, six, seven years, where although Afghanistan is not a member, now it has become, a, uh, I think it's a permanent invitee there. There are discussions that are taking place on Afghanistan in SCO every year where the Afghan president always attends all the summits. Other uh, aspect, you know, of importance of an organization is that SCO summits have taken place every year. That means all the countries find value that we need to get together and we need to discuss the issues. I think the organization will get significantly strengthened with the inclusion of India and Pakistan. As I told you, I don't think that the bilateral India-Pakistan issues are going to be discussed there. But I think for the region, and since India has identified Central Asia as an area of strategic significance and importance for us, and it will provide us with an opportunity, provide India with an opportunity to interact with them uh, every year at the top leadership level. And uh, Afghanistan is going to be definitely an issue that is good. So I think it is definitely going to be helpful. As far as CSTU is concerned, I think uh, one needs to recognize that as far as Central Asia, you know, whatever else uh, we keep it apart, but as far as Central Asian states are concerned, Russia continues to be the sole guarantor of security and stability. You know, in 2010, when Bakir had to fly away, but he flew away to Moscow. So, you know, in that sense also, there was a contribution of uh, Russia and CSTO. So I don't think one can deny the role or contribution of Russia as far as the security paradigm or matrix of Central Asia is concerned. Let me finish that and you know I think we'll have opportunity. Yeah, thank you very much. We definitely have opportunity. So please, Ambassador, stop down. So. Right, okay. Civil society, yes, I agree with the previous speaker. Very often in uh, Kyrgyzstan, but too much civil society activities, very dangerous. Otan Bayeva tried to do that. She was shown the way. You know, uh, Atan Bek took over immediately because of her you know, love affair with the European Union, OAC, and all that kind of thing. You know, that Osh thing, you remember how police from OAC came 
the SEO protected regime. So all that thing is uh, quite quite uh, tricky there. SEO no longer relevant after Obor. One by one road. SEO was a one man show. China. At the Chinese expense, SEO was running, but still very relevant because it has got a lot of legal issues. It protects the regime against criticism from the outside. It has a center for uh, anti-terror center in Tashkent, RATS. It's very useful. People, you know, for a country like India, they get a lot of information. So that's quite interesting, uh, still relevant, but the traction is now gone after Chinese have launched the Silk Group program and all that, the granders thing. So it's, it's less thing. Border, I think, yes. If you involved in border conflict, tricky. If you intervene in the border management and training, we do, like for example, giving them computers for tracking money laundering, crime. They love it. They like it. You know, this is this is quite possible. Drug trafficking. I thought NATO and CSTO will collaborate on drug trafficking, but the danger is if NATO and CSTO collaborates, drug trafficking towards Europe cuts down. It goes towards China and India. That's another danger. The 80 percent comes towards Europe. Only 10 to 20 percent comes to South Asia or East Asia. Because even the Chinese borders are very porous, because they can't stop drug trafficking. So it's it's a, it's, it's a, it can be regulated actually drug trafficking wherever you want to regulate depends on who collaborates where. So it's quite quite uh, tricky again. And uh, the rest, I think you know overall I see European Union is an opportunity for Central Asians. They also see now trans partnership, you know Pacific. TPP is also an exciting thing for Kazakhstan as a future thing. It could be quite an opportunity. For Japan, Turkey, India, they see it's an inspiring model. The issue is whether this inspirations, whether this aspirations, whether this opportunities can be put together to make a global strategy for Central Asia. Other than you know, this piecemeal kind of approach to Central Asia is not going to work. We've tried for 35 years or 25 years. It hasn't gained the traction. Uh, Russia still has the dominance. You can't rule it out. You know, to offset the Russian influence there is going to be very, very difficult. Without annoying the people there, it, it can be quite, quite, quite difficult. And we understood this. I, I worked in um, 25 years in that area, various capacities here and there. As also academic, uh, it's 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 quite entrenched, vertically and horizontally. The political elite and at the mass level, the media controls. What can you do with any civil society activities that Russian media controls everything? Thank you. Probably it was not exactly the argument I would like to hear <laughs> in the end of this panel. <laughs> but, but, but I think that uh, overall wrapping up... <laughs> No, wrapping up, uh, not the last one, but wrapping up <laughs> the whole panel, uh, I would like to say is that actually we all achieved uh, the aim of this panel, because the aim was really to look at security as a comprehensive uh, concept. And indeed, uh, what you mentioned, starting with uh, peacekeepers training, uh, bomb car borders, but also education and civil society, it really lays a very uh, wide ground for different international organizations, but also for individual countries to contribute to security and stability of this region. So thank you very much, and I will invite all of you to join me in a round of applause, thanking panelists and also going for lunch. <laughs>